it doesn't work very well in a number of ways. And so what I did over the years, I tried to think of other ways of working with men and women and young people who've committed offences that was more uh, are in, more likely to engage them in the desistance process. And I came up with the GLM about 20 years ago now and have developed it with my colleagues. Okay. Oh, um, so I'm just, yeah. Okay. Why do we need rehabilitation or, or interventions with people, programs for people who've committed offences? Oh, one thing I should say, um, I'll try and speak as slowly as I can, because I understand the um, majority of you are native French speakers. Um, I'm a New Zealander. We speak very quickly. Um, so I'll try and slow down and make it as clear as I can. Um, but obviously, for things you don't understand, you can ask me questions at the end. Okay, so back to the talk. So why do we need rehabilitation? Why do we need programs for people who commit offences. Well, prison is expensive. Um, I've got some recent figures from Australia uh, and um, it's $300 a day. It's probably about 200 plus Canadian. It's probably even more now. And prison really doesn't do a great job of stopping people from committing further crimes. Uh, it might prevent people from committing crimes, the threat of punishment, but once someone has been imprisoned, uh, we know that the reoffending rates are fairly high, as indicated in these figures. And so we need to do something else. So from the 1980s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, rehabilitation programs and correctional settings started to take hold based on the work of Andrews and Bonta, um, and essentially the, the risk need responsivity model that I'll call the r, &R. If you think about, I wrote a book with Shad Maruna, who's a fairly uh, influential criminologist way back in 2007. And it got me thinking about what are the kind of underlying attitudes towards um, clients and treatment that you can see in the literature. And I came out with four, four kind of um, basic approaches based on two independent dimensions, the degree to which a client's interests matter or they don't, and the degree to which the state's interests matter or they don't. And what I mean by that is the degree to which they strongly influence the kind of programs and approach that's implemented. Well, if the client's interests don't matter and the state isn't interested in rehabilitation, there's no interventions, that's, that's an obvious one. If the uh, state's interests matter, um, and the uh, client's interests don't matter, so interventions are led by the therapists and the state, if you like. So clients have very little say in what happens. If the state is disinterested or isn't, it takes the back seat in the rehabilitation, but the interests of the clients, and by that I mean their needs, their desires, the kind of things they'd like to happen, are taken seriously, then it's client-led. You can see these three approaches are less than ideal. Uh, no interventions, um, not a good idea. Clinician-led intervention is paternalistic and authoritarian, and you're not likely to get engagement from clinician uh, from clients. Client-led uh, an approach is problematic because clients uh, obviously have behaved in an antisocial way, and so you really need to have a clinician involved as well. So I think the ideal approach is the one in the bottom uh, quadrant, that it matters to the community in the state what we do with men and women who commit offences, but we also have to do it in a way that uh, takes the client's interests into account. So this is a collaborative approach where the clinician and the clients work out a collaborative plan that both agree uh, is reasonable and feasible and doable. Now the R and R, I would argue, is pretty much um, clinician-led uh, and led by the state. So what individuals want and what they desire, what matters most to the men and women in prisons, is of little interest to R and R people, and they tend to treat it uh, as um, more, if, if anything, as a kind of a moderated to some degree. It's not a central concern. 
Now, Andrews and Bonta and John Drow and Ralph Sirin and, and, you know, the Canadian group get very upset when I say this, but I think it's pretty clear when you look at their readings. Okay, so moving on, when I wrote the book with Shad, what I noticed is that there was really nothing in the literature about what a rehabilitation theory looks like. What's the structure of a theory? So I had a few ideas then, and I had a three-part structure. More recently, I've developed this idea in greater depth, and I, and I argue that what matters is a practice framework. So in other words, every, every intervention we see in correctional psychology uh, uh, assumes the viability or the validity of a particular practice framework. The r and does, as you'll see in the papers uh, that I've sent you, but there are other approaches to, uh, to rehabilitation like restorative justice. Um, and also um, just kind of ordinary strength-based approaches. And according to Warden Durant 2001, there are three linked components in a practice framework or a theory of rehabilitation. The very, at the very heart of it is a set of aims in which are based on values and principles. So this kind of tells us what are we, what are we trying to do? What, what's the whole point of working with men and women who've committed offences? What are we trying to achieve? Is it reducing risk? Is it, is, it hard, is it reducing the likelihood that someone will uh, commit further offences against innocent people? Is it wellbeing enhancement? So are we interested in uh, individuals, our clients' um, personal levels of wellbeing? Are we interested in helping them to live the life that they find more fulfilling, or are we not? And another uh, aim is moral repair, which is really restorative justice. Are we more interested in repairing the damage done by crime at the community level? Um, so what are our primary aims? And what you tend to see when you look at rehabilitation models, there's usually one or two key aims um, that are, aren't that often very well articulated, but you can spot them. And I'll talk about the R&R &R aims later on. And so once we have our aims in place, so we're, for example, we're trying to reduce risk, then the second question that's linked to this is what knowledge do we need and what concepts do we rely on to, it to help us achieve these aims? So, for example, what causes crime in a general sense? What is a risk factor? Uh, what is a protective factor? Uh, what are primary human goods? And what's a good lives plan? What, in fact, is a restorative approach to intervention? So. It only, so the idea is that these knowledge claims and concepts are only highlighted once we have our aims and values in place. So if we're interested in risk, then we're going to be interested in what is a risk factor. Um, and, uh, and we're not going to be very interested in well-being factors. So it's a bit like a searchlight that shines the light on a certain set of ideas based on what matters most to us. So it's, this, this kind of idea is very consistent with pragmatism. Um, where human interests uh, and aims pretty much determine the kind of, set the context for the kind of knowledge we're interested in. And then the third part of a practice framework are the practice priorities. So given, given our kind of primary aims and values, and given the knowledge that we think we need to help achieve those, how should we go about working with men and women who committed crimes? So what are our practice priorities? So given the above, what should we do and how should we do it? And you can see how this links them with the, the four quadrants I spoke about earlier in terms of the state's interest and the client's interest. So quite from some practice frameworks, a client's um, needs and wishes has very little standing. It's not that important. From others, it's central. And it seems to me if we're not clear about our underlying values and principles, um, it's going to be very hard to justify and make sense of what we do. And in my experience, this often typically doesn't happen. And this is just another way of illustrating that basic practice framework model or rehabilitation theory model. Um, and you can see they're kind of cogs that link together. At the centre, we have core values and principles that then kind of connect with knowledge-related assumptions that then connect with intervention guidelines. And the idea is these things link together uh, in a kind of integrated way. I developed the practice framework uh, idea because it seems to me there was very little in the literature on the relationship between explanatory theories and clinical 
uh, practice, what we do with men and women who commit offences. So you can see this as kind of like a bridging theory. I'll just now I'm going to talk about the R and R very briefly. I've written dozens of papers on the R and R. Um, some of them critical, some of them exposition. Um, and you'll all be familiar with it, but it's very clear it's been, uh, sorry, I'll go back. It's been highly influential and arguably it's helped to recover the idea of rehabilitation uh, around the world. Uh, this is the late seventies with the meta-analyses by Canadian researchers such as Palmer and John Drow and so on. And uh, has set the scene for, um, believing in the possibility of change, that, that people can turn their lives around. So once you commit an offence, it's not like you're forever doomed to do so. So the R&A, as you know, is based on, I think it's about 15 or 16 principles, but there are three key ones which give the acronym its kind of meaning. Risk, need, responsivity. Risk is about um, the kind of level, the, the probability someone will commit an offence, and we have categories of high, medium, low, and so on. Need um, are the kind of factors we, we, we should be focusing on in treatment. They're called criminogenic needs. They're basically dynamic risk factors that if we modify um, offending is likely to decrease. And responsivity is about the way we go about delivering programs based on someone's, um, based on the best literature, best evidence, but also the characteristics of the client. And it's kind of a, uh, an attractive model because it seems like it can do a number of things. First of all, it's been used to predict reoffending, um, to allocate, uh, allocate resources. And secondly, it seems like it's partly explanatory. It explains why people commit crimes because they have these dynamic risk factors and wh what we should do to change things. So it's highly influential and there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of enormously positive good things about this model. It's clinician led. Um, so if we look, go back to our quadrant, the client's interests are very little interest uh, that, you know, priority. It's the primary aim of the r, &R is to reduce cost to the state, uh, possible harm to the community. And this is the value component of the practice framework. There's concern for the client is, is secondary. It's not a primary aim. And the practice priorities um, really are to identify, eliminate, modify, manage risk factors. And by that, obviously I mean dynamic risk factors. And so this is the part of the r, &R practice framework where we can see the knowledge related assumptions, the concepts that are critical, what is risk, how does it cause offending um, and what we should do about it. So you can see uh, in, the, in my paper, that you guys will get, I go through the R&R in greater depth according to a practice framework model. So it's an interesting model, it's, it's very valuable, it's probably the dominant model throughout the, the Western world, um, and it's elegant, and it looks as if it's right on the money, but sadly it's, it's not. The problem is, it tends to lead to fragmented practice because the focus is on dynamic risk factors, which is seen as if they're discrete causal factors that contribute to reoffending. And what you typically see in programs that jurisdictions that use the r, &R you see this, what I call this tick and flick approach. So someone comes in to a prison, they're assessed, their risk factors are identified, and they might have drug and alcohol problems, problematic attitudes, problems with self-control and management, antisocial attitudes, and so on. And then they're allocated to programs that deal with these separate problems. And sometimes these, so for example, um, substance abuse is dealt with by substance abuse specialists, uh, social um, intimacy deficit problems are dealt with by a therapist, uh, vocational problems are dealt with by vocational workers, and what you tend to find is there's very little communication between the groups that work on these separate problems. And the problem from a client's point of view, they have no idea how things fit together. So they think, I've got this, I've got all these problems and these got, people are gonna help me with them. They've got no sense of how these things link together. And that's, uh, I think, uh, not a good thing. 
Secondly, the goals are avoiding. It's all about what we've got to take away, what we've got to reduce. And I use the pincushion metaphor to capture this idea. Because risk factors are seen as discrete, independent causal factors, um, um, the idea is you can target them separately. So we use the pincushion metaphor. Each dynamic risk factor, like intimacy problems, uh, deviant sexual preferences, and so on, are pins in a pincushion. And the goal is to remove them. So you take out the pin, treatment proceeds, and, and you're very happy from a, perhaps the clinician's very pleased because all the risk factors have been targeted. But the trouble is when you take out all the pins from a pin cushion, what are you left with? Well, you're left with holes, absences. So the difficulty is we can be so concerned about reducing and get, getting eliminating problems, we don't stop to ask a very basic question. What function um, did that particular dynamic risk factor play? So for example, if someone um, has some problems with social intim uh, intimacy, it may well be that, um, that they were looking, or they sexually abused a child, they're looking for intimacy or closeness or power or control. And if we don't find them an alternative way to achieve that, the chances are they'll either offend again, and certainly they're not going to uh, have very good desistance practices. Relatedly, it's very hard to engage clients. Um, by the way, you'll see I don't use the word offenders. I think it's offensive. I think it's problematic. And I don't think we should define people in terms of their offending status. We should think about them as people who commit offenses. So that's why I call them clients. So there's poor client engagement because who'd want to really work hard in an offending program, say a sexual offending program of a year, where you talk about your fears, your hopes, and what you get out of that is a, a lower probability of reoffending. And clients want actually to talk about their lives more generally. They don't really just want to talk about what they shouldn't do. And so, um, you know, it's very hard to get people to engage in programs within prisons, but also in the community most markedly is that there's very high dropout rates up to 50% because there's really very little in it for the person. And that's, I think, a warning sign. So I think this is one of the problems, reasons why there's so much focus on motivational interviewing interventions in our area, because we're getting, trying to get people to do things they don't want to do, because we don't really base our rehabilitation work on what matters to a client. High levels of treatment dropout I spoke about. Um, the, the final thing I'm gonna speak about, there are other problems as well, which I won't focus on, but I think these are the major ones. And I'm not gonna go into this last problem in a lot of detail. I've done that in various papers and it's quite complex, but the idea is very simple. Dynamic risk factors are not explanatory. Uh, and I mean that they're not causes in any straightforward sense. If you look at dynamic risk factors, what you'll notice is they're made up of lots of different kinds of things. So, for example, social problems. Um, there are issues to do with emotional um, vulnerability factors. There are things to do with social skills. There are things to do with social isolation. There's dozens of facets to each of these dynamic risk factors. And the reason for that is because dynamic risk factors were originally used to predict reoffending and still are. And people have thought, well, if they predict reoffending, then they're obviously causes and we can simply focus on them in our treatment. Uh, but they're not, they're not causes. They're what I call hybrid constructs there. They really, their function is to predict and you cannot use them without breaking them down into their components and bringing theory to bear. It's fascinating um, that no one in the, um, in the area, correctional area, seem to understand this. I wrote a paper with Tony Beach in 2015 because um, you know this problem, this kind of theoretical status of dynamic risk factors was simply not acknowledged and people kept seeing them as causes. And we know that we've got a good reason to believe they're not causes because if you look at research on within treatment changes or program changes on dynamic risk factors, what you notice is they don't, they don't diminish in a, in a regular way throughout treatment. In some studies, they increase, some they stay the same, some increase, some decrease. So looking just at within treatment changes, there's no systematic reduction, which tells us that they're not single causes. 
Um, they go all over the place. And this kind of makes sense of that. And if that's true, then basing our treatment on dynamic risk factors is not going to be enough because they're not single, nice, separate causes. So my view of the r and &R is that the principles are important. They're things we always ought to build into our intervention. So they're necessary elements of a good intervention plan, but they're not sufficient. They're not going to be enough um, because of the problems that have highlighted. So we need to think more deeply about what we do. So can we find a better approach? Well, I think we can. And we need an approach that addresses both the interests and needs of clients, the people we work with who are in jail or on probation or in you know, programs or on parole, and society, the community, the state. We need an approach that deals with both of these things. And in doing so, promotes more active engagement. So is there a way of doing that? And I think there is. I developed the um, Good Lives model back way back in 2002, three, and I did it because I was interested in the problems that the r, &R has. And I was thinking carefully about therapeutic change. I looked at um, behavior change principles. I looked at literature um, from positive psychology. I've got a philosophy background, a degree as well. So I looked at Greek philosophy, people like Plato, uh, and the Neoplatonists looking at things like uh, human flourishing. I looked at the literature and cognitive neuroscience. How are, how are our minds constructed? What kind of beings are we really? I looked at evolutionary psychology, the literature on happiness, and I put together the good lives model. And I've been developing that with my colleagues ever since. So what I'm going to do now is go through the basic assumptions uh, and ideas of the GLM. And I won't go through all the slides, as I said, I'll hit the main points and you can, talk, and you can read the details uh, on your own time. And I'm gonna really look at the three, the three components of a practice model I spoke about earlier. I'm gonna look at the core values and principles of the GLM. What are, what are we trying to do if we use this model? I'm gonna look at the knowledge assumptions, the epistemic assumptions around causation and the core ideas. And I'm, and I'm going to look at the kind of practice implications of this. Okay, so the good lives model is strengths based, and it's which means it it takes seriously the things that matter most to clients, as far as we can tell, and as far as they can tell us the things that they're good at, that but importantly that they want to put time into. It's also strength based, secondly, because it looks to give people resources for helping them desist from crime. It's about giving them the resources they need. And some of those will be internal or psychological, physical, biological, if you like. And some of them are external opportunities training. We need both. So capacity building is central. Secondly, it considers the clients we work with, what it is they're obligated to do in this process of change, which is clearly to desist from reoffending and not harm people. But very importantly, what are they entitled to? So given they've been punished, they've been in prison, typically, they've, they've kind of addressed, they've been morally sanctioned, what are they entitled to? What kind of resources as human beings? And this is, as you can, I'm sure you can guess, this refers to human rights and human dignity, and I've written a number of papers on this. And my argument is that R&R &R doesn't deal at all with an individual's entitlements. It certainly had, doesn't in its earlier incarnations. It's all about what clients owe the community. And that's not gonna work for all sorts of reasons. The so GLM focuses therefore on the benefits of inter interventions from clients. So rather than simply saying to a client, okay, you're gonna come along to this sexual offending program, for example, you're gonna work really hard for nine months to 12 months, you're gonna talk about your, your deepest fears, your sexual fantasies, you're gonna engage in practices that are, are very demanding and confronting. And what we can promise you at the end of that, that you're gonna be less likely to hurt someone else. That's really not an attractive invitation, invitation to change. Rather it says, look, 
what we're going to do is find out what matters most to you, the things that you want in your life in the future. And we're going to design an intervention program for you that reduce, that helps you to achieve these things in ways that will, you will find fulfilling, that are pro-social and mean you're less likely to hurt someone. So we have benefits. And it's collaborative because the therapist or the clinician works with the client to develop the program. Now, these programs can be group-based or individual-based, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that it, the plan itself is individual. There's no group plan. Every individual in a group, so you've got a group of 10 people, has their own good lives plan. And the plan is developed in collaboration with the person that you're working with. And so there are two intertwined, utterly linked goals. Attaining a fulfilling life, a chance at a better life, a meaningful life and alongside that reducing and management and managing risk and we're going to see later on if you if you build in resources in the right way if you help people achieve things that matter most to them in the right way you can also directly reduce risk i.e dynamic risk factors once you once you understand them in a clearer way Okay, so what are the knowledge related assumptions of the GLM? So what I've just spoken about are the primary kind of core values and the aims. Well, one of the assumptions this, and this comes from evolutionary psychology um, and um, cognitive neuroscience and biology more generally looking at uh, animals across the board, that human beings are by nature predisposed to pursue what I call primary human goods. And what are primary human goods? Well, their experiences, their outcomes, we seek for their own sake. So we seek relationships and closeness and social connectedness, for example, because we need these things. We, they're kind of basic natural desires. And if you ask someone, well, why do they want intimacy? They'll simply say, well, just the way it is, I just do. It's like a bedrock primary motivator, or what I call natural desires, that are partly based on our, um, our biological heritage, uh, but obviously culturally informed. So given this, to this end, given we seek these primary human goods for agency, independence, relatedness, emotional equilibrium, et cetera, we create specific goals, which are called uh, secondary goals. So for example, we might go about achieving the goal of autonomy, being independent through trying to earn as much money as we can, because then we can live the life we want. Or we might seek the goal of intimacy um, through having sex with children, deeply problematic goal. But the primary human good, there's nothing wrong with that. We all need intimacy. The difficulty is the way people are going about achieving it. So human beings implicitly uh, or explicitly decide on the means to achieve this. Now, it's an art, you can make the argument, well, if people are brought up in, in ways that are deeply problematic, do they really decide? But one of the assumptions of the GLM is that to some degree they do. There is the ability um, that the level of intention and decision-making is important. They can certainly decide once they're in treatment how to go about changing their behavior. And so at that level, there's certainly intentionality and decision-making. So consider collectively these goods, these primary human goods and the chosen means form the person's good lives plan. And the idea is everyone has one, um, even if they can't articulate it, every human being has a way of ordering the things, their natural desires, their primary human goods in ways that are expressed in their day-to-day -day life. And this is what gives their life structure. For some people, what's most important to them are relationships. So they might structure their life around their friends and their family. For others, it's about knowledge. So they structure their life around a knowledge acquisition, for example, as a researcher. For others, it's about having fun or pleasure. So they have more hedonistic structure to their life and the idea is that if you if a life without some kind of good life's plan is just chaotic and not possible to live so everyone has one but typically they're implicit certainly for the people we work with um, a way of understanding the model that underlies this assumption about natural natural desires and agency and this is a recent model that's come through in biology cognitive neuroscience uh, and psychology is the 4E model. And the idea, it's based on four key assumptions about human behavior 
that the GLM depends on. When I first developed the model, this the 4E really wasn't in the literature, and I, I've only become aware of it in the last four or five years. But certainly, the GLM is based on these, these basic ideas. And first of all, it accepts that human beings are embodied. We um, are all, our, our psychological processes, our emotional process are all tied to our biological instantiation. Uh, we're physical beings with mental capacities. And that means that what happens to our bodies affects our psychological processing. And you really can't separate emotionality and psychological functioning from the fact we have these bodies of a particular kind that have evolved through natural selection. Secondly, we're embedded in the environment in social and cultural contexts, where not only are we physically and biologically instantiated, but we're also socially, culturally located. We're creatures of relationships, okay? So it's a relational model, this view, this 4E perspective. Thirdly, we're inactive. So human beings are goal-directed creatures. We, everything we do from um, basic physiological systematic functioning to complex artworks or scientific experiments or whatever, are all based on goals and actions. And so we act in and, ma and manipulate the environment directly to achieve our goals, whether that's accessing food, achieving the goods of intimacy, education, relationships, and so on. And our environments offer us the opportunities or what's called technically affordances to achieve these things. So we've got kind of this idea that we're physically instantiated, we're relational creatures, we're creatures, we're goal-directed beings. We're always active in this seeking to achieve certain goals, which might involve approaching certain situations or trying to avoid or escape them. And finally, we're extended. So our psychological functioning is offloaded onto the environment to some degree. So we can see this in, uh, in culture, a cultural capital. And we can see this now also in technology. We use technical devices um, to help us think, remember. We use our relationships to modify our, uh, our, our states. We use our friends to help us think through problems. So that this is really, I guess, just another way of thinking about this relational nature of human beings. And the important thing is that you can only understand human agency in the context of their environments, our environments. We shape our environments and our environments shape us. So there's this kind of dynamic causal looping effect with our environment, which is called mind shaping. Um, but remember, we're not products of our culture according to the GLM or our social context only. We're also coming to the world with a whole set of natural desires of inherited tendencies and motivation. And we also come into the world with our um, biological and psychological systems and neural systems um, that influence how we think, what we need and what we do and what we're vulnerable to. So this is really just the agency part. Okay, so, Another important part of the GLM, and here I'm talking about this, again, I'm still talking about the knowledge-related assumptions, are a whole set of concepts, um, primary human goods, secondary goods, um, good lives plans, flaws in good lives plans. And I'm only going to talk about these in a, in a fairly basic way because we don't have a lot of time. What I did when I developed the um, GLM many years ago is I looked at the literature on um, quality of life, happiness, uh, well-being, evolutionary psychology, philosophy, and so on. And I come up with a list of what I call primary human goods, which, as I said, are natural desires for certain things that we just seem to have by nature of the kind of beings we are. And I've added them into roughly 11 categories. The categories aren't particularly important. Some people have six. We've used the GLM. Some people have more. Some people, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that each of these um, primary human goods can be, can be supported in the literature and seem to be basic to human needs and human functioning. And the idea is that if these things are present in our life to a, a threshold degree, our lives go better. If they're absent, we're going to struggle. So the goods of life are really about meeting our basic bodily needs for food, warmth, safety, and so on. Peace of mind is emotional control, equilibrium. 
So human beings don't do well if they're constantly uh, out of balance emotionally, if they're very anxious, very fearful, or even if they're always happy. You know, there's problems because emotions have functions. Uh, pleasure is important to us. Relationships, agency, being able to be self-determined to some degree. Now, of course, culture, culturals vary depending on the degree to which agency or autonomy is uh, focused. But even in more collective cultures, there's still a focus on individuals' responsibility and making decisions. So there's some degree of respect for agency. And my argument is because human beings are programmed to seek autonomy, decision-making. It's, it's kind of natural, if you like, to some degree. The form it takes will depend on the social cultural context. Uh, mastery at work and play. So the idea is human beings um, by nature uh, look to offload their time to play. Um, we're curious creatures by nature. And if you look at the literature on ch child development, children are curious, they ask questions. And this is important for our uh, psychological development and our social development. The goods of community, we're social beings. We, we need people around us. We're orientated. We take notice what other people think and what they do and we mimic others, we model our behavior on others, and what other people think matters to us. And this, this applies equally to people who uh, commit crimes, and you can see this in, in um, criminal organizations and gangs as well. Spirituality in the kind of broad sense of seeking meaning and purpose, and creativity in the very general sense that people um, seek some degree of novelty. And in fact, as we live our life day to day, people show a tendency to want some degree of variety and difference. And when that's missing, lives don't go so well. So the full justification for these um, primary human goods is in, in the literature that I've written on the GLM. And you know, they're in the chapter we sent you, you can read up about this in greater depth. But these assumptions, I think, are fairly robust about primary human goods. You can see them in the literature. I'm only going to go through um, a couple of them just to give you a sense of what they are. So looking at the primary human good of peace of mind, and this is really important for some kinds of crimes. For example, violence uh, and more narrowly, um, general violence and sexual violence or sexual offending. And so the idea is that human beings need some degree of emotional equilibrium for their lives to go well. And to achieve that, they need a whole lot of emotional competencies. They need to better manage their emotional states identify their emotional states. Uh, and they, um, if people are, are fraught with kind of fear, uh, anxiety or negative emotions, uh, life doesn't go well. And there are a lot of ways people seek to achieve peace of mind through exercise, meditation, using drugs, alcohol, sexual activity, um, to look at more, more maladaptive means. And you can get some people who seek to avoid dysphoric states like anxiety in very destructive ways. So I'm just, as I said, I'm gonna talk about a couple of these um, primary human goods, or well, three of them actually. So this one is on relationships. Human beings by nature desire to establish connections with other people. Generally speaking, there are always exceptions to these, but the exceptions we often we acknowledge are problematic. So I'm thinking of people who might have a schizoid personality style in, in the psychiatric sense where they, they are quite indifferent to relationships. But this is relatively uncommon and we recognize this as a major psychological problem. And the kind of relationships people seek vary, intimate, romantic, friendships, and so on. And then there are the secondary goods that spell out how people go about trying to achieve this primary goods of relatedness. So how do they Establish bonds with others? How do they establish intimate relationships? Well, they spend time with their friends, they, they uh, start relationships with people, they give support. Um, and some individuals might, in fact, have sex with children or get involved with pedophilic networks and so on, because, or gangs. Uh, and the final one I'm going to look at is agency, because this is important as well. This is really to do with individuals' ability. Um, a desire for independence and the ways they go about trying to achieve that. So, for example, people might plan. So they, they have goals that are important to them. They find that they come up with a way of achieving this uh, and they go and implement it. And if they achieve that in a satisfactory way, they have this sense of agency. I wanted something. 
I figured out how I could do it and I achieved it. And things like, you know, being assertive, uh, making plans, these are all secondary way goods that help us to achieve this basic desire for independence or self-directedness. But also people can do this in very problematic ways. They can try and control other people because if they think by controlling others, um, I can make, I can achieve what matters most to me. They can abuse, exploit. And you can see the opposite problem where sometimes people are utterly subservient to others. Uh, and engage in quite um, masochistic, destructive, dependent relationships. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to whip, I'm not going to go through these in any great depth. As I said, at all, um, these are really for your reading later on. Okay, so that's the kind of the concept of primary human goods. And the second major concept in the GLM is to do with what I call good life flaws or, or problems. And so the idea is, as I said earlier, every human being, according to the GLM, has a good lives plan, a way of structuring their life, a way of allocating their priorities. It could be um, around relationships, pleasure, knowledge, and they can do, and the good lives plan sort of spells out how they do that day to day, and that can be done in a destructive way or a constructive way. So looking at the destructive ways, people commit offences, and there are four major flaws. One is that the means by which they seek to achieve this primary human good backfires, it's counterproductive. So for example, drinking alcohol as a way of resolving tension doesn't work if that's all you can do. If you, the more you drink um, you have, or take drugs, typically you have problematic emotional states that occur as a result of that, whether it's in withdrawal um, or the biphasic effects of the drug. Or you can be harmful, behave in a way that's harmful to others, have sex with children. Secondly, the life plan might lack scope. So what you can see is that some primary human goods are just missing in people's good lives plan. So for example, a person might spend all their time working, they ignore their relationships, and they ignore their health. Um, there's some conflict at home because they, they're ignoring their, their, their marriage or their partners, um, they find it aversive they drink, that creates a vicious circle, uh, and ultimately they can commit crimes through um, this regulated behavior. Thirdly, some strategies are in conflict with one another. So this is, human beings don't like conflict and we look to resolve it. So for example, looking at the primary good of relationships, somebody might um, look to, uh, has, they're, they're conflicted because they want to be close to their partner, but they want to be close to their friends and there's conflict because their friends aren't married or aren't in a relationship and there's this conflict. Or something, going back to my earlier example, something, there might be conflict between a, someone's pursuit of excellence in work, they work all the time with um, their desire to have a healthy relationship, uh, a romantic relationship, and these things conflict and, and, they, and they're not able to resolve this conflict. And finally, and this is a more general one, an individual lacks the capacity or resources to uh, effectively implement a good life plan or to achieve the primary human goods in adaptive ways. The resources or capacities could be psychological, a person lacks the skills, for example, they don't know how to talk to adults, they're not very assertive, or they're, you know, they have a very aggressive mindset, or it could be external, that they're socially isolated, um, they're uneducated and so on. So the idea is that offending, if we put together those two sets of ideas about primary human goods, secondary goods, uh, and the flaws in a good lives plan, as well as the idea of a good lives plan, offending is the pursuit of legitimate goals. So the legitimate goals are the primary human goods. These are core values. There's nothing wrong with those by the inappropriate means. So the way they go about achieving these primary goods are problematic, and those kind of um, flaws that I've mentioned uh, reflect the difficulties you see. This is the inappropriate means. Or, and, and you can see these four strategies or flaws tend to overlap. If you've got one, the chances are you'll have other, others, but it's use, useful for a psychological or a therapeutic assessment to tease them out. So I'm gonna move on to um, in intervention in a minute, but before I do that, I'll just give you some examples of the flaws. And this, uh, and this is um, to help do this. I'm 
We did a study in America around 2012 where my um, research colleague, Gwenda Willis, traveled through America looking at sexual offending programs um, who said they were using the Good Lives model and about 50% said they were. And we looked, she looked at it, we developed a checklist and um, this is, and she wanted to know how well are these programs implementing the core ideas of the, G, of the GLN? And one of the guys she, she interviewed said this, as a kid, I had lots of examples of what I didn't want to be. I spent my life trying not to be those things. And then when an aide, a worker, a clinician, asked me five years ago what I wanted to be, I had no idea. So, so this guy had never asked the question, um, what it, what it, what's important to you? What would you like to do? What would you like to be? And this is really, as you can sense, this is about personal identity, the kind of life I want to live, the kind of person I'd like to be. And from the GLM point of view, these things are intimately directed. Our sense of identity emerges from the things that we do. And the things we do reflect our values, the primary human goods, and the way we go about achieving them. Um, well, so what I've got here is just a series of slides that unpack the notion of problematic means. And I'm not gonna talk about this in any detail, but just to highlight them for you. So um, you can see here, someone's look trying to achieve a bit of closeness. If you look at the guy, um, with the young child through child sexual abuse, someone in the bottom right-hand corner is trying to perhaps achieve the good of um, pleasure or the primary good of um, communities, hanging out with other people through um, snorting cocaine uh, and, and so on. So one thing I, I will focus on is the lack of capacity is very important from a clinical point of view. Because one of the things we want to understand, what kind of skill deficits or resource deficits does the person I'm working with have? And what do we need to do to, over, to give them the resources they need to desist from offending? And, there are internal and external uh, resource capacity problems. And a good example in America, and I'm not sure about Canada whether you have this, uh, is the sexual, sexual registration, uh, the registration for sexual offending, where people um, have to register on a public, often it's a public uh, forum, a, a website, and people know who they are. There's also restrictions on where they can live, which effectively, um, if, if it's not done in a kind of a careful way, can make it very hard for them to live uh, fulfilling lives uh, and productive, constructive lives. And obviously the internal um, capacity problems are to do with uh, skill deficits, knowledge deficits, um, behavioral excesses, and, and so on. So now I'm looking at the third aspect of the GLM. So I've spoken about the core values, those two are, um, well-being enhanced and fulfilling lives, and secondly, reduced risk. The core ideas, the good lives plan, primary human goods, secondary goods, good life flaws, they're the kind of key ideas. Uh, and then the third part of the practice framework of the GLM is you ask the question, in light of these two sets of ideas, how should we go about working with people? And so it's kind of logically linked, if you like. Well, the aims of intervention is to help someone develop a plan for living, what we call a good life plan. Uh, and one thing I should, um, should emphasize is that from the good lives, GLM point of view, there's no such thing as um, the best, the right way to live your life. Each of us could live our life in quite a lot of number of different ways. And when I talk about good lives, I'm not talking about morally good lives. I'm talking about what we call prudentially good lives, lives that help people achieve higher levels of well-being. So they're, they're values that relate to happiness and fulfillment and adjustment and pleasure, um, not whether someone's behaving in a morally correct way. Now, of course, as clinicians, we need to make sure the plans we develop don't, um, aren't based on illegal or immoral acts as best we can. Um, but the key, the key thing is to understand what constitutes a plan that's a good life plan for the person, uh, and as long as it's not illegal. So in this plan, we develop the primary human goods and we figure out um, how best to achieve them, how we go and do about operationalizing them. And the other thing I, I, I didn't say when I gave the list of the um, 
primary human goods. And um, I'm kind of, this is the focus here. You're really interested in coming up with a plan that is focused on the primary human goods that matter most to the person. And this is really, because this reflects their sense of identity and meaning. So according to the GLM, each of those primary goods, um, we need them all to some degree, but most of most, typically people uh, emphasize one or two over the others. So for example, for some people, knowledge is much more important for some relationships, for some good of the community, for some spirituality, for some pleasure. Um, and the idea is that um, we need to understand what matters most to the person and build our plan around that. Because if we don't, the, the chances are we're not going to engage them. So if you're dealing with somebody who values um, creativity most highly, and your good lives plan, your plan, venture plan has nothing to do with that. Doesn't, you know, you just try and get them a job, for example, as a, you know, I don't know, washing dishes or something, then you're going to have a problem of um, adherence and ultimately persistence. And the idea here is that our sense of who we are and what matters most to us links to our personal identity, links to our primary human good. So we need to establish positive approach goals for achieving these goods. So we need to fix, this is the second goal, how are we going about helping this person be creative? Um, perhaps they're good at carpentry, they like carving, uh, and that plan might be based around that. And I'll give you an example later. I realize I'm speaking much longer than I should. I'm sorry about that. And I'll try and speed through this stuff fairly quickly. Um, and we need to make sure our plan, when we look how, how we can build skills and resources through practical activities, things that as clinicians or as workers, we can help people achieve, whether it's through therapy, vocational training, working with a family, um, uh, and so on. And our intervention planning is collaborative. We need to ask the person, well, what is it? Okay, I, you know, you've, I've assessed you. A little of information, I understand why you did what you did, and uh, I also understand what matters most to you. So, what we need to do is come up with a plan that helps you to achieve the things that matter most, for example, being a carpenter or a mechanic or gardener, um, in ways that um, you are likely to succeed as best we can, that you're going to find engaging and meaningful, and that reduce your risk of harming others. So the plan is driven by the values and goal of the person. It's at the center of everything. So those primary human goods that are most highly weighted are at the center and your plan is based around those. Try and make sure the other all the primary other goods are in there, but your most attention is paid to the one things that matter most. I haven't got time to go into um, the detail how you assess that, but in our writings, and we've got manuals and books, we, we have a whole set of strategies for figuring out what that is. And so you help the person develop the plan and you need to make sure there's reasonable balancing. So, um, you know, the person needs to pay attention to the, the, the rights of the community, um, but also um, there needs to be attention to what matters most for them. So their interests as well as the interests of the community. Um, and they're individualized. So even if you, your, your program's a group one, it's based around um, everyone has their own plan. And at the center of this are the primary human goods that matter most to them. And, and in your plan, you kind of link things together. What I'm gonna do very quickly is just show you how, how this is done. But before I do that, I'll talk about risk reduction because what Andrews and Bonta and Siren and uh, uh, those guys consistently argue is that the GLM ignores risk. Um, hopefully you can see that's not the case. It's one of the prime goals. And GLM reduces risk in two ways. It reduces risk directly. So people develop the capacity for achieving goods and this can reduce risk. So for example, they develop a whole range of emotional competency skills. They're able to identify and manage emotions, which therefore means they're less likely to um, be emotionally dysregulated, which is a risk factor. Uh, indirectly, it can reduce risk because people are often more motivated by engaging in programs, even in part things that I want to do, if they think they need them to achieve a valued good. So for example, if someone wants to be a mechanic um, and you know they don't really want to go on the alcohol reduction program, 
but they understand that they're going to need to do that in order to get training as a mechanic. But they also understand that if they're drinking and intoxicated or they're taking drugs, it's going to be hard for them to learn, acquire new skills. Um, and they can see how the addictive behavior directly interferes with things that they want to achieve. Uh, and this is the example of a wood carver. I'll go through this very quickly. This is based on a real case. Um, this was a, um, uh, a Maori man, it's an indigenous New Zealander in New Zealand uh, in an Auckland program. And his primary human good was creativity. He was always like to make things and he, what he liked to do was to um, carve bits of wood. He was untrained, but he really loved that. And this was a guy who was violent. Uh, and committed rapes as well. Um, that was, he was violent committing rape, but he was violent in other ways as well. So what the therapists did is they come up with a good life's plan that helped them develop. It was based around this wood carving idea. And the idea is that, you know, he would gradually learn how to do that. He would gradually learn, um, um, you know, he'd be entrusted with tools that were kind of potentially dangerous. Uh, as, the pro as his program went along, he learned how to, um, to cut wood, how to carve and how to polish and do all those things. And this is spelled out over time. And all the other parts of the program are based around this. And not only that, John could see why he needed these other skills. So he could see, yes, he obviously needed the wood carving skills, but he also saw that he needed to learn to listen. John wasn't very good at listening, which is why he got aggressive. Because if he didn't listen, he couldn't learn from his tutors. Um, and he could see the relevance of that. He needed to learn how to relax and, and all those emotional regulation skills, because if he didn't, he would make mistakes. Um, he'd be so aroused or uptight that he would destroy a piece of wood, which was expensive, uh, and his design wouldn't be very good. He needed to learn to communicate more effectively, so he wasn't very good at listening, wasn't very good at uh, being assertive or expressing himself, because he needed to communicate to the tutors and other people what he did and didn't know. And what he what he needed. Same with he needed he was illiterate. He needed to develop literary skills. He wanted to read and learn about his culture because he was Maori, but also to learn more about wood carving. He needed to learn problem solving skills because one to figure out problems in the wood carving, but also more generally um, to problem solve social conflicts, which could get in the way of his uh, wood carving, but also make it harder for him uh, once he left prison to effectively work as a woodcarver if you couldn't get on with people. And the cultural reconnection was important and you could um, as well. And that because the woodcarving he was interested in was a, um, a Maori woodcarving, which was based around ancient traditions and cultures. And I guess in Canada, you do have indigenous Canadians um, who've been here for thousands of years and will have their own traditions very similar. Okay, um, I'll go. I'll leave you with the evidence, um, and I'm going to go right to the um, final quote, and then I can uh, open up for some questions. I wrote this many years ago, and it seems to me I didn't know it at the time because I was still developing the model. That this this kind of sums up the good lives model absolutely perfectly. And the quote is this, we have been so busy thinking about how to get rid of crimes that we have overlooked a basic truth. Individuals want the possibility of better lives, not simply the promise of less harmful ones. So you can see here that the two tw the twin goals of the GLM to do with well-being and enhancement and fulfillment, which is the possibility of better lives, and the, the lie of less harmful ones, which is the reduction of harm to others, reduction of risk, they all go together. And the idea is that if we don't offer people a chance to live differently, and, it's, and, and, and it needs to be a constructive, concrete way of living that they recognize as something that they value and is achievable. And they can see how all the elements of our treatment and interventions fit into this model. Um, they're not likely to engage. My reading of the recent outcome literature on the R&R, &R, and, and there's some, been some recent meta-analyses, is that the results are disappointing. The effect sizes are small, um, but they're significant. There's some suggestion that once you try and roll out the programs, um, they're not very effective. 
So why is this? So I, I guess the point is, and I think in part the problem is we don't engage people. Um, we're not we're not t tracking natural desistance pro processes, which is about reintegration, social capital, psychological capital. Um, we're not focusing on agency, which is a basic biological imperative, if you like. Um, and we're not, um, and we're using ideas that are based on problematic constructs. And I guess the the upshot of that is there's a long way to go to improve things. Um, yes, what we do now is somewhat helpful, but you know, um, a lot of people still come back to prison. Thank you. <laughs>